Uh, welcome into the Rotary Club of Wellington uh, weekly meeting. Wellington, uh, Rotary Club of Wellington serving humanity from the heart of Wellington since 1921. Uh, it's been a great weekend to be a Wellingtonian, uh, getting through to the semi-finals, uh, and uh, now the or getting through and now the semi-finals this weekend. Uh, at the president's table today. Uh, our guest speaker, Matt Clark, uh, the Chief Commercial Officer for Wellington Airport, uh, on the way forward for planes coming to Wellington. Uh, at the table today, Dave Wells will introduce and thank uh, Matt uh, and Jeff Shaw, our Sergeant. So, uh, pleased to see uh, you all here. Everybody, mobile phones, if you could just check your phone as however you want it, on silent or vibrate or off. Uh, and if you're not wearing your name badge, you've got a, one chance to pick it up on a break. Uh, uh, to save you getting fined. Uh, and visiting guests uh, and visitors, uh, I'd ask Helen first to introduce your guest. Roger, welcome. <laughs> Alexandra, I'd like you to welcome your... Um, President and David, welcome. Uh, and William? My pleasure to introduce Rachel King, who calls herself a Kiwi Chinese. She's got a dual uh, nationality. She's a businesswoman. She's been here for six and a half years. And she's very keen on becoming part of the culture and community of Rachel. Rachel, welcome. Uh, and Suzanne? Janine, welcome in. Uh, welcome to all of our uh, visitors. Uh, are there world travellers uh, arrived back? You know what to do, both of you. Uh, and world travellers are departing. And Donna? Uh, could I invite Helen to say grace, please? Fellows, Denzel reminded me that on the Christian calendar today is St James Day. And some of you may know that the relics of St James are buried at the Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela in Spain, the end point of the Camino Trail. So on this day we seek protection for those many members of our club who walk and bike such trails around the world. Those who've come home safely, those who are on the trails at the moment, and those who are planning their trips. And in these turbulent times, let us be more generally mindful of the safety of all who travel by land, by sea, and by air. And further, we recommit ourselves to service of ourselves. Amen. Thank you. Uh, on birthdays, just uh, three, uh, Sir Anand on the 22nd, uh, Marion on the 25th, and Jeff Eads on the 25th uh, as well. Uh, on Friday, a number of us attended uh, Bob's funeral at St John's Presbyterian Church on Willis Street. Uh, it was a lovely send-off of a former president who served 
uh, 18 months between 1996 and 1998. Uh, Bob, uh, as it came out during the service, was born in Hastings in 1930 in time for the Napier earthquake. Uh, joined BNZ at the age of 16, stayed 42 years, uh, rising to become the chief executive. He completed the BNZ building on 1 Willis Street uh, and after the global financial crisis focused on Tikaranga wines. Bob was heavily involved with arts, tramping, wine, the Boys and Girls Institute. Uh, as came out on Friday and today, we'll remember Bob's service with pride. Uh, rest in peace, Bob. I'll now invite uh, Jeff uh, to host the sergeant session. Right, President and uh, guests. I, uh, I moved to Wellington, this isn't an introduction speech by the way, but I was going through some of my notes from my introduction speech which has never been delivered and I thought I need to have a bit of fun with Wellington. Um, because when I was moving down to Wellington they said, oh it's a scary place, there's earthquakes, there's wind, there's all sorts of things and I thought, I've been in Wellington now for two years and I haven't felt a single earthquake. And I'm touching wood, don't worry. I mean, I managed to miss Rotary the head it the other day, so I thought, you know, this place isn't as scary as you guys think. There's a lot scarier places around the country. See, Wellington's known for its earthquakes, of course, um, and I was reading some history, and the New Zealand Company withheld those earthquakes from the uh, prospective settlers in 1840, and of course, 1855. Um, the Wellington, what's now the, of course, the airport, was saved an awful lot of money in earthquake, uh, earthworks by the lifting of that surface. You imagine how much money we'd be spending on on the airport if they hadn't had that earthquake. There's a lot more dangerous places to live around there. So just as a, people have to put money in the tin, who hasn't lived in another city in New Zealand for more than two years of their life? Right, you can all put some money in. You've just been playing too safe. I lived in another city in New Zealand for 50 years before I moved here. So, Auckland's a lot hotter. And by the way, as reference to Peter Cornish, um, uh, volcanophobia is a fear of volcanoes, and I don't have it, but a lot of people around New Zealand should. So how many volcanoes does Auckland have? Only 48? Actually, the number I thought was 56, but it is indeed 48. Last one was about 600 years ago, Rangi Toto. They've discovered a new one under the um, Auckland Medical School in the last couple of years. And um, so the doctors are hotter than you thought. And uh, Stonefields, which has got 2,500 new houses in, is in next to the largest one and actually in the, the old Mount Wellington Quarry. Um, that's the Auckland domain there in the middle. So um, no matter where you go in Auckland, a lot of them are quite hidden, some of the sports fields, Lake Pupuki. Um, there's a lot. And if, is, actually, the other question, of those who have been to Auckland, who hasn't climbed up Rangi Toto? Right, OK, so you can all put some money in the tin. You need to do an next trip up there because it's a fantastic climb. That's the list. So there's the places not to live in Auckland if you don't want to live on a volcano, which pretty much is everywhere. No matter where you live, there's a volcano. Even the Bombay Hills are old volcanoes. So they range from 100,000 odd years old right the way through to um, 600 years. So you think it's dangerous here? There's volcanoes up there. Northland's quite hot too. How many volcanoes from Whangarei to the Bay of Islands? For those of you who said 60, you'd be right. I didn't know that, but I thought. So, but it's a good place because they get 10 cyclones on average a year, so you can get wet as well as, as, well as cooked. So. That's quite a powerful photo of Christchurch, obviously. And, of, of course, Christchurch has taken over from Wellington from an earthquake capital. But how many volcanoes? 15 vents and two massive calderas which of course have formed Banks Peninsula and it's actually the only um, second most visible volcanoes that you have from space. Bay of Plenty, the most volcanic active region in New Zealand. Anybody climbed Ruapehu? Right, okay. If you haven't put in, you're exempt. Right through to White Island. But the most biggest recently active volcano, any guesses? Lake Taupo. 
largest explosion in the world in the last 70,000 years was Lake Taupo when it went off for the first time. And the largest in the last 2,000 years actually was 233 AD, released 120 cubic kilometres of material. 30 kilometres of that within a few minutes. So picture Krakatoa and multiply that by 30, and that was Taupo. Um, it actually blocked uh, the outlets, and so the lake rose 35 metres, so 100 feet, uh, and the flood was 200 times when that released down the Waikato River. Of course, that was the last time anything dangerous happened in Hamilton. <laughs> <laughs> New Zealand's safest city. Um, and, it, and my grandfather came from there, so I can give Hamilton some stick. Most geologically stable, a lot of companies are locating their data centres there because it's not going to get tsunamis, significant risk of fog and extreme risk of boredom. <laughs> <laughs> so, has anybody here lived in Hamilton before? Right, okay. You need to put some money in for escaping the place. The only dangerous thing in Wellington for Hamiltonians is extreme hurricanes next weekend. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Jeff. It's a slightly unusual five minute speaker slot today because it's more than five minutes. Uh, and it's Stuart on really gearing us up for the wine options uh, evening that we've, uh, the club has done for a number of years. Uh, and uh, Stuart, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. <laughs> well, first of all, I'm going to tell you what it's not. It's not a wine tasting, although tasting is part of it. And it's not a boozer. Although you do think a lot about wines, in fact, you think a great deal about wines, even if you don't drink a lot. What is it? It's a competition to identify the answers to questions about wine. And if you don't know the answer, you hazard a guess as to the correct answer from four options. One of those four options is right, the other ones are wrong. It's good fun, there are good wines, there is good food, there is outstanding fellowship, it is a fellowship evening, it is educational, and you'll be well rewarded if you take note of the lessons on wine appreciation, not just on the night. You won't just learn on the night, you will actually help you appreciate wine for the rest of your life. And there are prizes to be won. Quite good prizes, mainly chocolate. <laughs> How does it work? You are placed in a team. Ideally, there are six, seven or eight in a team. And believe it or not, that's more or less as we're placed now. And you're given a sample of wine from a bottle which is in a bag with a label on it. There it is, A. All right? You are, or more accurately, your team is asked a question about wine A. You are told four possible answers, but only one is correct. Your team agrees an answer. So we'll take the tables as teams. You have to agree a captain amongst yourself, and only your captain can give the answer. OK? If your team, if your team answer or answers correctly, your team gets five points i.e. you get it right. If your team answer is incorrect, your team gets two points for trying. They get it wrong. <laughs> on the night, there are typically eight wines with four questions on each, i.e. 32 questions with 128 possible answers, only 32 of which are right. Evaluating the wine. Now, I think it would be a good idea at this stage, if you selected the most able-bodied person from your table, and sent them over to this table and got a tray of glasses. Now, you need to find out before you come how many people on your table want to take part. Because if there's a teetotaler or a wowser there, there's no point in taking them back to So... I think that's a correct term for it. Thank <laughs> you.
Now, has everybody got their wine? Or well, everybody, right, look at it. Colour and shade is important. Smell it. The wine's fragrance gives huge information about what it is. Taste it very carefully. Make sure your mouth is clear of other flavours. Over 90% of the wine is tasted in or on the nose, through the top of the mouth and at the back of the throat. Just the tiniest drop on the tongue, pressed against the roof of the mouth, should do the trick. Now you need to realise, of course, that there are wine tasters who go to competitions who taste four or 500 wines in a day. And they actually virtually have no wine at all. They just have the tiniest smear of wine on their tongue and press it onto the roof of their mouth. And they can actually get all the flavour of the wine. And it really, I mean, people who booze wine ought to be shot. I mean, wine, <laughs> wine is a beautiful product and every drop should be appreciated. OK? Now, the more you know about the wines, the more likely you are to win prizes on the night. But it's still great fun, as with almost every question, somebody on the team has the right answer. It's just that the others in the team thought they knew better. We will provide some information, but the simple lessons on the internet are as good a source of information as any. If you look up wine appreciation on the internet, you'll find out everything you need to know about wine very easily. Here's a little practice as to how it works. Please, uh, yeah, I've done all that. Um, Look at the wine, smell the wine, taste the wine. Now, between you, agree the correct answer to question one. Now, normally you'd have a card with a colour on it because you don't want the opposition to know what your answer is. So you just have to... you, And we're going to trust you to do this honestly. So you need a captain, and your captain needs to agree for your table what the right answer is. OK? So you select somebody, have a little discussion, and the answer to question one is Chardonnay, Riesling, Sauvignon Blanc, or Pinot Gris. I'll give you a few seconds. Right. We can't, waste, we can't wait too long or the president will shoot me. OK, folks. Have you decided? If you haven't decided, hold your hand up. Haven't. If you haven't decided, right, everybody's decided. Have you got the answer there, Patrick? You haven't? Well, I can tell you it's a Chardonnay. OK? So now you need somebody on your table who is good at numbers. And if you, if you got it wrong, they remember the number two. And if you got it right, they remember the number five. OK? And we'll get on to the next question, too. Yep. <laughs> Does this wine come from Germany, France, Australia or New Zealand? Now, actually, you can taste continental wines. They taste different from New Zealand and Australian wines. And um, it's going to be a real test of those who think it's a terrible wine, because generally speaking, you can tell the difference between Australian and New Zealand wines for the obvious reasons. <laughs> German, French wines generally are uh, not as sweet as German wines, but they're all very much generalisations. 
But on the night in the competition, we, you will have wines with the characteristics quite predominantly, and you should be able to recognise where it came from. So they're all good wines. There's no such thing as bad wine. It's like having bad beer. There's only good beer and better beer. There are excellent wines and good wines, nothing else. Now, so you need to decide whether your team is red, green, blue or yellow, and you need to decide now. Is there anybody not, any table not agreed? OK, well, the answer is New Zealand, yellow. So if you got that right, you can add five to your previous total, and if you didn't, you can only add two. And we'll get on to the next question. Here we are. Now, New Zealand, listen, listen, listen. OK? Yellow, New Zealand. OK, now, you can tell how old a wine is usually by how fresh it is. OK? So no wine should be drunk unless it's at least two years old. One year in the tank and one year or in the cask and one year in the bottle, I regard as the absolute minimum. There's plenty of bank managers who make the winemaker sell it as soon as he gets it out of the cask because he's got to get the bank overdraft down. But generally speaking, um, you should now only be drinking wines that are of the 2014 vintage, and that wine will taste very fresh. Okay, one year in the bottle is enough. Two years in the bottle is best, but it's not. There's not much difference between one year and two. After two years, you'd need to be a real expert to be able to detect the difference. Although some, especially some wines, do actually mellow away forever, and certainly there's plenty of wines that actually improve for 20 years, but very gradually after the first two. So, is this really old, 2000, 2005, 2010, or 2014? And if you've made up your mind, everybody made up their mind? Teams agreed? Right, the answer is yellow, of course, 2014. Okay, now add up your points. Is there anybody on 15? Any team on 15? No teams on 15. Any teams on 12? Yeah. Oh, we're all on 12. Righto. Well, we'll see if we're the next one will sort it out. Now, where on earth did this wine come from? So is it from Great Barrier Island? Is it from Hawke's Bay? Is it from Marlborough? Or is it from the home of Chardonnay in the world, Gisborne? So you can work it out. Now, you need to actually work out <laughs> okay have we all decided anybody yet to decide okay we're all decided well the answer of course is that the answer is blue it's from Marlborough <laughs> and who got it right who got 20 points who got 17 Now, on your table is the yellow form. If you want to come on the night, please put your name on the form with the number who are coming. If you need to go home and discuss it, there's plenty of these around for you to take home to remind you. Thank you. Thanks, Stuart. What is the wine? Oh, what a good question. Here we go. After the question, you can take it off. Century, which is a which is a it's sort of a Spanish style where there are no winemakers who grow their own wine. These guys uh, live in Marlborough, they gather up local grapes and make wine. The ones that fall off the truck. Yeah. <laughs> Century 2014, Marlborough Chardonnay. Thank you, and that should help fellowship time. So enjoy the rest of the wine and fellowship and see you back at one. <laughs>